All right, I want to take a shot at addressing a really important topic in EI, the quick deployment of the Japanese sword. And that would be injury prevention. Now, that's a massive topic in itself, but I wanted to start by focusing on what I've experienced as, well, what I would consider one of the highest risk technique combinations. It's also one of the most common initiation techniques, and that would be drawing the weapon into that rising or horizontal cut or slash. Right? Okay. Now, I wanted to take a look at this with different kinds of swords in terms of different curvatures and also a couple of different wear options. But my best piece of advice to you is don't listen to me. If you are a student or have the availability of a school in your area to study traditional Iaido, definitely start there because they will meticulously cover, train, and ingrain the basics to keep you safe. If you don't have access to that kind of resource, then there's also a ton of channels right here on YouTube where you can start picking up some of this, again, slowly and carefully. Much better than I can teach it to you. However, if you know, there's just something you feel like I can add to the equation or you particularly enjoy listening to me or watching my, my crazy demonstrations. Well, you also know that my focus is on pragmatic versus traditional arts. So after doing that for 45 years, I cut corners. Cutting those corners does increase my risk to well myself. So don't try this stuff at home. I am in no way what you would call a professional. That out of the way, all right. Proceeding cautiously, let's see what I can add to the conversation that might help you. Let's start by defining this particular disaster. What's happening is you are rushing. We're going to come back to that term a lot. You're rushing from the draw into the cut. Two different angles of momentum. Even though it looks like one move, it really shouldn't be. But what happens is, because you're rushing into that circular action, usually about right there, you wind up ripping the end of the sword, about that much of the blade in most cases, through the top of your saya. Now, at the very least, you're going to take some damage to your saya. Or you might fully split your saya. And if you split your saya, What's the next thing that's in the path of that rapidly moving razor sharp blade? Well, right there. Hopefully this has never happened to you already. You may have seen it. I, I've seen it. Or you may have heard about it. Now I admit to begin with, I've come close in my own experience. Not just in the beginning. If I haven't been training for a while and I try to jump back into it without refocusing on the basics enough, rushing, I get close to that danger zone again myself. So you have to take your time, be careful, and observe the basic principles. So we're going to break it down. Now one thing that's actually saved at least my hand in my early practice was the use of a Shin Gunto, and I, I heard one of my commenters make a, make a similar uh, observation that having a saya that is, well, wood-lined but steel, yeah, you'll mangle the inside the wood liner and probably blunt your Mona Uchi, <laughs> but at least that steel will protect your hand. So bonus Gunto. However, I'm going to definitely not only recommend, but demonstrate starting with 
well, Boken, even a Boken without a scabbard. And then if you can get your hands on one, start with an Iaito sharp sword way down the road and not without, again, observance of the basics. Now, it is usually a combination of rushing and sometimes focusing too much on power that caused the accident. In any martial art, in any martial art also involving weapons, trying to go too fast. Well, this is fast drawing. Shouldn't you go fast? No. Speed will come. I tend to use the term quickness over speed. Because if you try to push the envelope of how fast you can move, especially when doing it also with, with how strong you can cut, that's when sloppy stuff happens. So take it slow, pace yourself. Don't rush. Now, the other reason this happens is because you are fundamentally, well, your body likes to move in curves. However, there are very different curves between the draw and the cut slash in this situation. So I'm actually gonna break down the two different components of this movement and then put them together and hopefully give you some advice on where you might well, pay more attention or be able to improve a couple of things that you, you might be having problems with. So let's get to it. Let's look at the cut separate from the draw because you really do have to develop the cut. Well, any of the techniques that you're going to use in Iaido or any other form of swordsmanship, before you start combining them in ways that are, well, potentially risky if you don't transition well between them. They really do have to stand alone and you have to consider how they function alone. Now, we're talking about a one-handed semi-rising cut. In other videos I've discussed my angles of attack, my concepts of cutting angles, not the traditional eight. I go by the angles of a clock. So if I'm facing the clock, the one we're looking at today for me would be from about eight o'clock to two o'clock, okay, this way. Rising cut, but kind of shallow. Now I could make that the steeper one, go from say seven to one, yeah. Different body mechanic though, and it also works with gravity a little different, especially versus a straight horizontal, the nine to three, this way, very different. So I wanna specifically focus on this one, and yes, one-handed, because obviously it's coming out of the scabbard one-handed. Couple of things to consider. Again, if you're not doing this as part of sword drawing, how would you do it in general swordsmanship? Develop the technique, and make it effective. Well, you're probably starting it from somewhere on the left side of your body. In extreme chambering, it's probably gonna be somewhere over here, a waki or gyakushagamai or something like that. Where is it going? Where is it ending? Are you cutting through into something else, okay? Are you cutting through to a point and then reversing it on its own course, like say Musashi's left side attack, like that? Or are you cutting to stop? This could also be, for instance, a parry or a simultaneous parry cut, or it could set you up for thrust. You gotta figure out, okay, what are you doing with it and then develop that. In previous videos, I've also described how for fencing, I've worked on shortening the chambering of my cuts so I can initiate something like that from a fairly short distance, okay? Not having to bring it all the way back, but from something else I've done out in front of me, I can do the technique. Now that's very useful for Iaido because in Iaido, shall we say, you have a very short runway. Where are you initiating the cut from out of the scabbard? Well here so you better get good at doing the cut from here and practice that separately where is it coming from well depending on where it's initiating and where it's ending you're talking stance you may actually be stepping to propel it better legs waist core 
Since it's a one-handed cut, we can talk about alternation of shoulders, which we can talk about when we get to the scabbard in Sayabiki. How much of it is coming from shoulder? How much of your elbow is in play? Probably not a whole lot. How much wrist, how much change in grip helps give it that little extra oomph? But you've got to figure out what you're capable of doing with the cut separately, train it separately before you chain it together. And the same thing's gonna be true would be my recommendation for any kind of EI kata. Whatever you're doing, train the components separately, then start putting the pieces together. You've gotta to be good at the components before you can, you can assemble the puzzle. So, the other thing I need to talk about, I talked about not worrying too much about speed. I also wanna talk about not worrying too much about power. Tama shigiri can be a great thing, can be a potentially very dangerous thing. What am I talking about? If you practice Tama shigiri with tatami, especially multiple tatami, do you change your cut to try to power through those more resistant targets as compared to when you're practicing kata? You probably. The thing is, there is a difference between cutting and slashing, and this is a Musashi topic that we'll cover, but in this context, I need you to consider what you need to do with this cut and what you don't need to do with this cut. This is a very sharp weapon if you're using a real one. It's got some mass behind it, and yeah, even in a fairly short, well, I kind of call it a gentle action, you're getting a lot of momentum behind that. How hard would you need to make contact with someone's face, side of head, neck, or depending on what they're wearing, arm, hand, to do an effective amount of damage? Do you need to cleave them in half? Also consider in that difference between cutting and slashing, most of the kata that include this technique out of the draw, this is followed up usually by a much more decisive and powerful cut or cuts. This is an opening move. It can be very effective in and of itself, but you're usually not stopping and shouldn't be stopping at the one thing. So don't feel like you need to overpower this technique. Speed will then come as you learn to chain your momentum together naturally. Don't rush it. It'll happen. This is, I'm, I'm always kind of fascinated that this is one of the first things trained in Iaido is where you draw into a cut like this, because this is actually a very challenging cut to get down. It's, it's pretty advanced. So take your time, practice it, get comfortable with it and get comfortable knowing what you can do with it, how well you can control it before you advance to combining it with a draw with any speed whatsoever. Let's look at the draw. Starting with the bokan. What are the problems with a bokan? Well, it doesn't have a scabbard. Now, you can certainly get a bokan with a scabbard. So, the other thing is it doesn't necessarily have a suba. And that can potentially restrict your movement in the draw a little bit, but in some ways actually improves your indexing. But what you try to do with a bokan in terms of developing some really basic skill in sword drawing is make your hand into the koiguchi if you don't have a, a scabbard hold it where you would be wearing it and practice the draw so that what would be the edge doesn't make contact with what you're imagining is the top of the saya and you just need to continue to do that over and over again now i would certainly start with partial draws you want to be able to make contact with the back of the blade, that's fine. Riding that rail, that's great. If your scabbard is turned sideways, perfectly okay for gravity to have the side of the blade sliding. That's not going to hurt anything, but you want to avoid feeling undue pressure with the edge against the top of what would be the scabbard. This means making the straightest, smoothest draw that you can and there's a couple of ways to maximize it but i'm going to go ahead and advance myself back to the shinken speaking of blade contact with saya 
One of the things you may have noticed is depending on which sword I'm using, they make a different noise coming out of the scabbard. And that is because I'm usually drawing because of the, the lack of range of motion in my wrist. I'm not drawing upwards. I'm usually having to turn my weapon to the side. So there is some gravity pressing the side of my blade into the side of the saya. And depending on the shape of the blade, whether it has a bohi or not, the type of steel, and any imperfections in the saya, well, all of my swords have different songs. This one has that little ring at the very end. Again, what I'm trying to avoid is any real contact with my edge against the top of the saya, no matter what. But that requires I really, again, develop a very straight action here. A couple of other ways you can do it that come from traditional practice. One that I can't do is you'll see often people recommending that you draw up to two-thirds of the length of your blade out with the edge up, then use your left hand to turn it to the side, and then finish it. That can actually be very helpful to minimize the risk of this particular injury. So if you can do it, I would certainly recommend you, you check it out. If you're not already training with it, it's highly recommended. But yeah, my, my arm just doesn't work that way anymore. The other big thing that helps with this is, is Sayabiki. Now, you don't necessarily have to extend your weapon and, and withdraw it, but I tend to wear my, my katana very, very snugly, so there's not a lot of play here. But any backward action, even a little bit, from the left hand, all right, what I'm looking for is to create a counter pull between my hands and shoulders. What am I talking about? As I mentioned previously, the body likes to move in curves. There are actually empty hand techniques where hands alternate in different techniques in curves versus trying to make that same move very, very straight, okay? You're focused on doing it very straight as compared to this way. So making a straight pull between your hands is going to help you with this draw. So I am, even if the sword isn't moving much, I am pulling back, exerting force. It's also turning my hip a little bit. And that is a counter pull against the forward movement of my hand here. So basically, I'm really focusing on that, all right? Now, you'll notice there's a little bit of a ring, again, because my thumb isn't very strong, where you'll notice that as soon as the weapon clears the scabbard in this orientation, it does drop a little bit. And that's fine, because for me, that sets up the cut very, very nicely, or any of a number of other techniques. But I'm definitely going to recommend for all Iaido, you spend a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time just practicing whatever technique you're going to use to effectively, precisely, and safely clear the sword from the scabbard. Okay? Just that. And I'm even, that's fast. I, you shouldn't be doing it that fast. Start start slow. Really work on the mechanics of making sure no edge contact with Saya, no premature ripping action that's going to hurt you or the Saya. This will also potentially influence how you wear the sword, size of your Suba, length of your blade, all sorts of other things. If you cannot comfortably clear the weapon, consistently without you know over straining yourself in any direction over extending yeah you might consider a different blade different blade length we'll look at curvature also different wear like i said i'm using a very firm belt as compared to a lot of yaido practitioners that have a lot more play in where the scabbard's going to go when they pull it back now one thing I specifically, why I, I don't, I, there's a couple of reasons why I don't go with a looser belt. One of which I've mentioned in previous videos. Sometimes that Sayabiki will really shift the weapon back and around you. Okay, that's creating for me some curves. Okay, this way and this way. Two things I don't want happening 
when part of my blade is still in the scabbard. So again, if I do that remotely prematurely, I'm going to have an accident. So I just learned to be super comfortable with a very rigid mounting on my waist. So any pullback is really just kind of counter tension between muscles. Okay, so you don't really see me move much, but you might see the side of my body do a little short little whip. Not much. Maybe it should be bigger, but again, this is what I'm comfortable with. If you're being trained to do it another way, go with that. If it's working, stick with it, go with it. There's a reason for it. Also, it would allow you potentially to draw a longer weapon. All right. Now let's take a look at the chain. All right, let's chain together the draw and the cut really, really slowly, like Taiji slowly. Well, not quite. Again, certain techniques I don't use out of preference and others I don't use because you just don't move that way anymore. As I mentioned in the previous section, there is a lot of safety and wisdom to starting the draw edge up and then turning it, but I just I don't work that way. Also, a lot of wisdom to having a little bit more play here, but again, that's not my preference. I've had bad experiences, so this is, this is just how I've learned to operate. But what I'm trying to do first is use that counter tension between my arms and my hands to get as straight a draw as I can get, clear the weapon, okay, and then consider what happens from here. Now, going back to starting the draw with the edge upwards, as a general rule, some of the practitioners will say, well, that makes it unpredictable. The opponent doesn't know what you're going to do. Well, the fact is I can have my sword turned in any direction and they still don't know what I'm going to do. The idea is out of any draw position, you could do any technique. And that should be the rule for any of your swordsmanship. And we'll get back to this when we talk about postures and positions and things like that. You should always have options. You should always be unpredictable. But in this case, we already kind of defined what we're going to do because, you know, that's, that's what we're working on. So we'll focus strictly on that. Me having to turn my scabbard to the side to start out with, I'm going to create that straight draw and that counter tension and the rest of the body dynamics. What I'm looking for is the cleanest, semi-straightest draw I can get until I feel something very specific happening. And you're going to see it. You'll notice that the tip of my weapon drops. One, because my wrist isn't very strong, and two, because my thumb isn't very strong, and three, because, you know, okay, the weapon's a little heavy. I know I'm a wimp, but I'm actually waiting for that. That is my tactile signal that I'm free, literally free, okay? Now I've got to figure out, okay, from here, where can I go? And again, unpredictability, I have pretty much endless options. However, since I have chosen the exercise we're working on today, I have to consider that once I am here, and I'm going into here, can I take advantage of any of that residual momentum? Kind of like rolling downhill a little bit, even though it's going uphill. I'm not trying to make it one action, but I'm considering once I put the energy into quickly and naturally clearing the weapon, is there anything left over to give this a little bit of a push start? All right. So I am still very cleanly delineating this from that, but I can still take advantage of residual momentum. Now, it's not all just from the movement of the sword in my arm. It could be, you know, how I'm physically, bodily moving into it. My stance, my stepping, my hips, my core. Again, the, the pulling back from, you know, my other hand, even though it's not moving very much. All those things put together can then chain the two together so they look pretty seamless. All right, makes sense. Let's talk about a couple of your other options, shall we? All right, we're already getting into a pretty long video, so I'm calling this bonus content. 
What about blade length and curvature? Much shorter blade, Kokatana, much easier to clear, move into that initial cut, minimizes my window for potential disaster if I get sloppy. Of course, I'm sacrificing reach and, well, some tip speed in the power cut. But the lesson here is if you are training with a weapon and no matter what you do, you find yourself just having to stretch way too far, put too much strain on the wrist, you're not clearing the scabbard very well, you might need a slightly shorter sword, maybe only an inch. On the other hand, if you're feeling like you have a ton of room and freedom here, you might consider going a little bit longer. And again, your systems might have their own means for measuring what the appropriate size sword is for you. I've got my own tricks. We'll cover them another time. All right, what about a straight blade? I don't have a long straight katana. I have my, my ninja toe, but I've already shown you a short one. It's kind of a cheat. So with a full length blade, I'm going with my tang dao. Now, for drawing edge up, I found straight blades work actually better than curved blades. But for edge to the side draws, I don't have the ability to kind of take some of the little curve that I can get going this way to turn it into that. So I really have to focus on making a very straight draw and yet a sharper transition with less residual leftover to transfer into the next move. So yeah, not, not as good. So in some directions, it's actually nice and others, well, not so much. Okay, what about more curve? We'll start with this one. This is my Musashi Fast Cutter, modified has a bit more sorry than some of my other katana, found that more curve does make horizontal edge up draws a lot harder, at least for me, but anything edge to the side or edge down, I've actually got more, well, ability to be slightly sloppy, to put just a little bit more curve into what's otherwise a straight draw, which then translates for me smoother into that circular cut. So what I get is, well, less of a transition between the movements. Minimizes a little bit of that risk because of the curve. It's just a little bit more comfortable. Now I'm gonna show you a sword that's even more curved than this, but in order to do that, we need to talk about, okay, different kinds of wear. Certainly not traditional, but wearing my Ryan Sword Tachi edge down from its hangers. You'll notice the two Keep it very horizontal at the hip, but you know, I find this kind of problematic for walking around in. The upside is if I'm drawing from an edge down orientation, or even turning it to an edge sideways, because it's lower on my hip, I've got more room, more reach for the draw, and because the scabbard is naturally freer, yes, there's naturally a lot more room for that counter pull, that Sayabiki. So yeah, that can give me a very free draw combined with the extra curvature of this Tachi. It has a deeper story than my other swords. Yeah, I can get into those circular actions a lot quicker. Now you're gonna notice that even though just hanging free, it, it's, it stays reasonably put. But if I wanna resheathe, I have to consciously turn it over, put it away, it's just a little less nice. Let's talk about a lot less nice. Shin Gunto. Not to say that the Shin Gunto isn't nice, but as I mentioned in other videos, the preference of a lot of officers was to shove it through the belt edge up, Ushigatana style. If you wear it just from the single hanger, the good and the bad of that. Well, yeah, it does hang a little bit more vertically, so you're not as likely to knock stuff over with it, but you might be a little bit more likely to trip over it yourself, especially as we take a look at it once the blade's out of the scabbard. So if you don't have your hand on it to stabilize it, it can kind of be all over the place. But because of that extra reach and freedom of movement, combined with potentially, again, more sorry, I've got a lot of room to not only do you know a better curve longer reach in the cut, have more residual left over after the draw, but again, more counter pull Sayabiki naturally. So yeah, I can really clear it 
quickly, easily, usually error free. And if there is an error, as I mentioned earlier, having a steel scabbard to protect your hand, if you slop it, well, it's not good for the sword or the saya, but at least you won't need stitches. So, now, let's take a look at that really quick. That's really annoying if you're trying to move around with that just hanging there and then trying to find it again, turn it in the right orientation to resheathe. It's, it's doable, but it's, it's not very well neat. However, this opens up the door for another topic. Swords hung from hangers. Is there a conversion for EI to European swords? Hmm. Let me give that some thought, and you might see some of that in the future. Until then, I hope this was, well, not overly long. Interesting, useful information. Let's get that conversation going in the comments. And as usual, thanks for watching. Hope to see you back for more.